Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first web seminar, doctoral web seminar for the spring, featuring Ryan Boylan. He's a doctoral student at Georgia State University. And Ryan is now in his fourth year, and he's getting ready to prepare for his comprehensive exams and also to write for his prospectus. This is not uh, Ryan's first time at presenting one of our web seminars. He's presented at least two other times in the last couple of years, and so we really appreciate his insights whenever he has opportunity to share them with us. Uh, I am the moderator. I'm Peggy Elbers, Professor of Language and Literacy at Georgia State University, and I also want to give a shout out to Tuba Ange Crowder, who couldn't be with us tonight because she had a writing seminar, and I am very thankful for her to building up our website that shows people uh, people's topics and their um, pictures and when their web seminars are going to take place. But Tuba has been instrumental in creating our Facebook page and she's instrumental in securing speakers. So we're very excited about that. These are web seminars, mentoring seminars that are really designed by doctoral students and for doctoral students. It's always a delight for me to hear doctoral students' perspectives on different topics because they really have different kinds of ideas than what professors present. And so we're very excited to have people like Ryan and uh, some of the other ones. I think Yaram and Jihei are going to be presenting either this spring or next fall. We're really excited to have doctoral students share their insights into different aspects of the doctoral program. We're going to be extending our doctoral web seminars to different doctoral students from across the country and hopefully across the world as we start to establish this particular set of web seminars. I'd love to see this extend into a global conversation around doctoral preparation so that we can learn from and with each other because we in the United States are not the sole owners of what it means to have good doctoral programs. They exist all over the world, and it would be lovely to start to hear about other doctoral students' experiences. And these mentoring sessions can be of a different, different types. They can be research-based, so you could present your research, or you could present on some aspect of the doctoral, um, the doctoral program and or mentoring yourselves into the academy. And tonight's presentation by Ryan pub, uh, getting published is just one of those mentoring sessions one of those particular parts of being in the academy that allow you to get the position uh, that you want after you graduate. We encourage you, as many of you I think are familiar with the Blackboard Collaborate tools, feel free to chat and ask questions of Ryan in the chat area. I'm going to go ahead and collect those questions. Or if you'd like, you can just raise your hand here like this. And you can, and I will call upon you and you can ask Ryan your question just by speaking into your microphone or into your computer. So we're really excited about having you participate and ask any kind of questions that you have of Ryan as he's presenting. It is really my pleasure to present Ryan Boylan. Uh, Ryan's one of my students, and I'm very proud of him. He's very self-directed, he's very motivated, and he's got very clear visions of what he'd like to do in his research. He's got experience in presenting, and he's got experience in teaching university courses, but his research interests are foreign language education, especially how culture informs how people study a second language. And so he has been working on a pilot study in regards to that and hopes to have that published probably in the next year or so. And um, he has just been a wonderful student in terms of volunteering for different aspects of participation in the doctoral program. So I really yeah, very much appreciate that. And it's with um, a great deal of pleasure that I introduce Ryan Boylan and he's going to be talking to us about getting published. So, Ryan, you're on. Thank you, Dr. Albert. <laughs> Thanks for that wonderful intro. Um, yes, tonight I'm going to be talking about getting published, uh, the inside scoop. I kind of happened into it, uh, I don't know, a few years ago, um, 
with, with help from a colleague or, or uh, in, a professor in the uh, Modern and Classical Languages Department at, at um, Georgia State. And along the way, I've picked up some, um, some good tips uh, to improve my writing and to make the process go smoother. Uh, one thing I think to start out with is that it is a process and that we, uh, as scholars, as researchers, we have to start somewhere. And I mean, I know Dr. Albers will say this, but I'm pretty certain most um, experienced scholars will say this, that as they look back to their writing, they recognize that their writing has gotten better over the years. Their writing has um, it's become more, uh, they've been able to tinker with it and, and tighten it up as they've come along. So hopefully by the end of my presentation, you'll have an idea of at least a place to start. I think we lost you, Ryan. Is your vo Will you check your mic again? Yep, that was me. Sorry. Oh, okay. okay. So <laughs> right. we are in a publish or perish situation um, in at Research One institutions, or at least that's what we're led to believe um, that publications and, and that portion of your CV are very important to tenure. Um, to full-time positions, um, to professorship. And one of the things we need to understand about publication is it's not just any publication. We need to focus on articles in referee journals, in peer-reviewed journals, which are the ones where you have, um, you have your peers, your colleagues that are looking over this, people in your field that know the substance of what you're writing about, and they're the ones that are saying, yeah, this is really good. This is really good um, research that's been done, and this is something that's, that's groundbreaking, if you will. So here's a look at my publications. I've only got a couple, as you can see, and, and I also have a, a, a book review in there, which kind of is just another little line on my Vita. Um, but we have to start somewhere. Um, it's a small journal, um, Foreign Language Association of Georgia, but it's a place to start. And like Dr. Albers said, I'm working on a pilot study, working on writing that out, hashing that out, and hopefully I can uh, look to uh, different publications and a little bit um, more well-known publications as I go along. But again, like I say, the point is to start somewhere. You've got to start somewhere. And Starting small is not a bad thing. So where do you start? You start with a great research idea. Um, and my research idea right now is looking at culture and how putting culture, at least for my pilot study, putting culture into a, a classroom where you're using a cultural piece in the target language to a, talk about culture, but also B, work with vocabulary and see how that affects the vocabulary understanding and retention of the student. Once you have your idea, and sometimes these take a while to do, but once you have your idea, you carve out your research question. You figure out, okay, what do you want? Now you know that your idea is, for me, it's culture. So where do I want to go with culture in the foreign language classroom? Um, so then once you carve out your research questions, and again, these take, you need help uh, oftentimes from your advisors and, and from those in the department, your colleagues, you know, reach out and say, do these ideas work? And you want to make them as, you don't want to make them too broad in general. You want to kind of funnel those questions down so you get a nice, uh, easier, if you will, kind of narrow question to deal with. Then what you want to do is you want to let your research question determine your methodology. Decide how you want to run the experiment. 
what research, what methodology is going to give you the richest data for your experiment, your study, whatever it may be. What methodology? Also choose the location, the participants, the instruments you're going to use. And again, this is all where we, we talk to and we work with each other and we work with, with the professors in our department and, and scholars that have come before us is looking at this research that's been done before and saying, okay, these are the tools that have been used and either use those same tools perhaps or perhaps modify them, right? But the key here is to let the research questions determine the methodology. Don't go in there and think, and this is something I'm, I'm actually learning a, a lot more about in the class that I'm taking this semester, is don't marry yourself to a methodology um, to start. See, Ron, Work on your research questions, then get, okay, good. Uh, then get your methodology. Sorry about the interruption. Thais has a question for you. Thais, would you like to ask your question yeah. to Ryan? Yes, hello, Ryan. We've never met. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. I really liked your um, your theme, too. I want to know where you got that from. But I wanted to know, the first thing you mentioned was start with a great research idea. And I know that you mentioned also that you're in your fourth year, but what year do you start this? Um, and I'm asking this because um, we were talking in class the other night about having uh, maybe three publications before you graduate. And I know sometimes the publications need to be about different things. So I just wanted to know when, what year of your studies do you start to think about these research ideas? Well, it's a great question, Thais. And, and the answer is you want to start sooner rather than later. Um, I think it was put up on the, in the chat, but you do want to start sooner rather than later. There's no set year that says you must start in year one or year two, but you really want to start probably year two no later than year three, depending upon how long your, your doctoral process is going to go. Um, and, and you want to, you know, that, that could be a starting point of getting the ideas ready and starting to flesh out the research questions. Um, as far as when you graduate, yes, you do want to have, it's really nice to have publications under your belt. The number is, again, that one's kind of up to you um, as to what you get out of your study. And the other thing is, is you can actually, depending on how you do your studies, depending upon the number of participants, the way you run it, the methodology you use, you can actually get multiple publications out of the same study by looking at it through different lenses, if that makes sense. Does that, that answer your question, Thais? Excellent. Okay. So, once you've finished with, you've gotten your ideas early on in your doctoral program, you're starting to get your, your, your research questions, how you want to run your experiments, then you have to go through the IRB process. And that's very, very important that you do that. You make sure you get your institutional review board to approve it and to approve your study. And that basically is, is walking through the type of research you're going to do, that everybody knows the, the, what the benefits they're going to get out, what could be the possible drawbacks of the study, things of that nature, um, just so that we're well informed and we, we understand that basically the information that we're going to do is going to be kept anonymous um, so that we're not calling people out or, you know, because if you notice a lot of research, Names are changed. Um, you know, demographics might be changed a little bit. Um, just not demographics, but but um, some of the some of the details might be changed just a little bit to to keep it um, anonymous. Once you have that done, then you run your study. You're off. You're running. You run your study, you collect your da da data. And once that's complete, you analyze it and you code it. And that could take several forms. Um, it, again, depends on are you doing qualitative or quantitative data collection or both. Um, you know, and, and so, but, and again, that also comes with the help of 
of those around you, your colleagues, your professors, et cetera, to help you figure out, okay, what's the best way to analyze this data? But you should have an idea of how you're going to do it when you get into your data collection. Say, hey, Ryan, um, could you talk to them a little bit about what you are analyzing in terms of this pilot study that you're working with? That might give them a little bit more insight into that number six, that point number six. Yeah, absolutely. So what I've done with my study is I've taken, I, I did, it was a three-part uh, data collection. At the beginning of the semester with this group, I had three classes of students that I was working with at the college level, and two of them I gave the experimental, the treatment, as we call it, the, the cultural context of which to notice the vocabulary. The other section, I simply gave them, I simply taught the vocabulary pretty much as it was in the book um, without any cultural background. At the beginning of the semester, I interviewed the students. I did more of a qualitative um, instrument. I used a qualitative in instrument, and I did an interview. And I interviewed a bunch of students, a number of the students, and I basically asked, what are your uh, perceptions, what are your opinions about learning vocabulary, about learning culture? As during the semester, I used vocabulary quizzes, one per chapter, I took that as my quantitative data to see if there was a difference in the scores on that uh, for each se section that I was, class that I was working with. And then at the end of the semester, I did another quantitative piece with an, an interview that basically followed up with some of the students and said, okay, so now that we've gone through this, how did you feel about this process of learning with with um, learning about culture, did you what did you learn? If you learned anything um, more about culture, is this something that you know you would be interested in doing? Learning a way you would learn in the future. And so then, what I did was I ran SPSS on my um, my quizzes and the quali uh, quantitative data, and I looked at is there a significant difference at the 0.05, alpha is 0.05, um, and I looked at is there a significant difference there uh, between the scores of the two treatments and the control groups that didn't have the cultural treatment. And then with the interviews, I went and I looked at both sets, both before the class began, the semester began, and at the end of the semester, and I looked for reoccurring themes. And I found themes like, um, I found themes like, uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, one of them was flashcards. I think was one of them using flashcards or repetition to learn for to learn uh, vocabulary, for example. And so I would mark that on my my interviews, as well as I think I found five other different themes that reoccurred. And so those then, when I write it up. I will say, you know, these are the themes that I encountered that the students kept coming back to um, as far as this type of, of um, this type of uh, teaching of vocabulary is concerned. And then when I put them together, I'll talk about the quantitative piece and I'll talk about the qualitative piece. I'm not going to um, say one of them um, backs up the other one. I'm just going to say here's two different pieces. And this is what each one says. And so that's what I mean by analyzing and coding the data. It's quant uh, quantitative. You'll probably use a tool like SPSS to analyze it. Um, and then with qualitative, you'll go through and you'll look for themes um, if you're doing the interview path. And, and you'll mark those um, as you go along and, and see what, what, um, what student, you know, what's, what's emerging there, okay? Once you've done that, so you've got your data, it's completely analyzed, coded, whatever you have to do to get through. You're now ready to write. You're now ready to write. Now, if you're like me, you may start staring at a blank computer, a blank Word document. Where do I start writing? Um, 
Well, some of the things you need to consider when writing are your audience, your readers. What is the purpose of your writing? And that's something that you're going to put in to your introductory paragraphs is what is the purpose of your study um, and, and who are you trying to target with this? Uh, and so you need to keep that in mind. Are you trying to target uh, just specifically, for instance, in my case, am I targeting foreign language educators in general? Am I targeting, um, am I targeting just Spanish teachers? Because that's the language that I teach in. Who, who am I targeting? And then the other, that also will help you pick out which journals, which I'll get to in a little bit, which journals you want to think about putting your publication in. So on that, you find a way, you, you start, one of the things you need to do as you're going along with writing, one of the things that makes you a better writer is being a good reader. So go in, at, and it can be before you start writing, it can be while you're writing, but look at journals. And again, this is something where you reach out to colleagues, uh, professors, and you get ideas of what kind of journals are there out there for language arts, um, education type research. For me, what journals are out there for foreign language, educational, uh, pedagogy, pedagogical journals, right? And so you have a list of them. You have a list of them. And, and India is right. You look at how the introductions are written. You look how everything is set up in those journals that you're interested in because that's the format that they're going to be looking for. And you can also get some good pieces of how to phrase things um, along the way. Um, but again, more reading can oftentimes equate to better writing because you know, you see how it's written. You see how things are put together, how things are phrased. You see how the scholarly language uh, evolves uh, in, these, in these journal articles. And so once you've done that, you've determined your audience, and you've got a focus of, of which scholarly journal you want to shoot for, then what you do is you set up your article. And it's a pretty standard setup. You have your intro, and, and this is, this, all this information here, by the way, is also very good for your dissertation um, because a dissertation is just a really, 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 really long, in-depth article or book, if you will. So you look at your intro, your overview, your purpose of study. Why did you choose to do this study? Why is it interesting? Look at the literature review. What does the literature say about the topic that you're talking about? And maybe even more importantly, what does it not say? Where are the holes? Where does the research need to go? And then how does your study build on the, the existing knowledge and kind of open up the doors to these, um, these, oh, these, these spots that are not filled in? Then you're going to put your research questions. Then you're going to put the so your literature review serves several purposes. It talks about hey, this is what the literature says. This is what's out there. This is what's been studied. But it also says this is what hasn't been studied yet, and this is where I come in and my research comes in to add another level to this to these studies. Then you put your research questions in. These are the research questions that I'm looking at, which we've already fashioned and we've already used to run the study, so that should already be there. Then you put in your method section, participants, instruments, procedures. Who were these people? Where were they located? And again, remember that we're trying to keep these things, trying to keep some, some anonymity here. So when we talk about participants or we talk about where they were, for instance, if I'm going to talk about the school that I did my research in for my pilot study, was a, a, a school at a university in the southern United States. I'm not going to name it. I'm not going to give that it's in the state of, you know, whatever state it's in. I'm just going to say it's in a region, right? That's the same with the participants. You want to be a little more specific. You want to talk about how many possibly males versus females. Um, was there a cultural makeup of it? Was it 
heterogeneous genus or homogeneous in that makeup because those things can be important when you're talking about when you talk about the research they can they can lead into your limitations um, or or new directions for the future so once you have those fleshed out there and you say this is how I collected the data this is how I analyze the data then you talk about your an analysis in your findings you go back to the literature review a little bit and you say so we so we know that this exists so this research and the analysis shows that this we can add now to what the body of knowledge that we know or we can begin to start seeing that this new piece may fit in there and then you you really put that also in relation to each research question so you go back and you really you you look at your research questions and you answer them in order so that it, it kind of brings everything back full circle you do your you talk about your discussion next um, overall impact of your research you talk about limitation was it the fact that you only worked with one school in my case that's something I could put in limitation um, was it the fact that um, maybe if you're doing a, a case study or a narrative inquiry you've only done one person or you've only done a couple of people and you know it could benefit research could benefit in the future by looking at more people then you also talk about future research implications and one of my professors has told me that they are always when they write their future research implications they're actually always working on that that next piece anyways so they're going to be the first ones to start answering those questions but these are the types of questions that as you start getting better at your research and your writing you can start saying okay this is what needs to be looked at next and hopefully maybe you can get a jump on that and you can continue to be a ground groundbreaking in your field and then when you, once you do that that's also a call for more research that's also saying you know this this topic isn't exhausted there are there are pieces of the larger topic that may have been talked about and hashed out enough but there are still other pieces we need to look at so that's where you, you put out that call for more people to do research and look at different aspects because again when you do your research and your writing you have a specific lens that you're looking at and a specific focus that you have and somebody else may be able to add another dimension in another area that you're not familiar with and so we're always building on each other if you will now we've written we have put it in order we've looked at the journal where we the journals we want to go to we put it in in the way they want it we try to use the, the language that they're using so now how do you get published well it's kind of a it's kind of a, a trial and error process so remember when I asked you to make a list of journals you want to publish in that's where this comes uh, uh, back to the professor I referenced before they actually have a list above their desk of all these journals that they are that they've either published in or that they know that they want to publish it and they they look at that list and they say which one fits best with what I'm working on now make sure that your article fits the mold of other articles in that journal again language um, the setup and then submit your manuscript hit send again also ensure that it's peer-reviewed now some of you may be a little worried about well what if I get rejected well I'm, I'm sure that even now dr. Albers still gets manuscripts sent back that say well we will take it but with revisions or it may not be the best fit for our journal um, you know even the best scholars have those types of responses so don't be afraid of rejection also remember you only want to submit to one journal at a time don't go through your list and say okay I'm going to submit it to one two and three not good form you submit it to one 
You see what happens. Do they approve it? Do they reject it? Do they reject it flat out, or do they say we will take it with some revision? Um, and, and once you get feedback from one, that can probably help make it stronger. And if you don't want to go back to that, that journal or, or you know, they say, well, it's just not right for our journal, then you go to another journal. Because, again, different journals have different criteria and look for different things. Hey, uh, Ryan, can I just uh, – this is such a good tip. I just have to say, I just wrote something that I, I got this information from somebody just a couple of years ago. I wish I'd known this when I was a doctoral student. And that is, if you get rejected, as Ryan said, send it off again. However, the tip that I got was that send it off again to another journal without revising it according to the rejection reviews from the journal that you just got rejected from. And keep sending it off and sending it off and sending it off. Send it off at least three times before even attempting to revise it. And I'm just going to give you an example. Christy Pace and David Brown and I wrote a paper, and we sent it, or maybe, no, it was David Brown and I sent a paper off that we had worked on. We sent it to three different journals. We revised it the first time around, and then the second time I said, David, let's just not revise it. Let's just ship it off. So we shipped it off to two other journals, didn't get anything, got rejected, and then just uh, several, a couple months ago, we got an exception, an accept from the middle school journal of research. And we didn't do any revision after that first time that we, we revised. So it's really pretty, people think that you should revise according to the reviews, but not necessarily just ship it off to another journal. And until you get a third rejection, then maybe revise the piece. But that was the best bit of information. And I think Christy, yeah, Christy and David and I, we also did the same thing with a piece that we finally got accepted for literacy and technology. But we sent it to, what, three places, Christy, before we actually got an accept. And we did revise it some, but I would never revise it again. You know, the next time I send something off, I'm just going to send it off. Not, And if I get a reject, I'll just send it off to another place. And if I get a reject, I'll send it off to another place. If I get a reject, then I'll revise. That's really good information. And the other thing that I wanted to point out that Ryan is saying too, if you get a rejection or if you get a revise and resubmit, even better, this is what I didn't know when I was a doctoral student. I thought a revise and resubmit was not a good thing. However, I'm an editor of language arts. If you get a revise and resubmit, it means that you have been shortlisted. And what I mean by that is your manuscript is is being um, is being really courted for publication in that journal. Um, as an editor, I know that when we ask people to revise and resubmit, we have a total of perhaps three articles that we can produce in our journal. We probably invite three to four people to revise and resubmit. So always, always, always do a revise and resubmit because that, the chances are that you're going to get published. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, no, it's great advice. So you keep doing it. You keep plugging away at it, and eventually you will get accepted and approved, and you will have yourself um, a publication. But, but these things can take time as well. The other thing that you have to remember with the turnaround is, well, two things, first of all, two things to, to remember about submitting. Number one, turnaround time. Um, you have to get familiar with the game and, and not, be, not be upset or be okay, rather, with the game of hurry up and wait because that's what you'll be doing a lot of times is you'll be waiting you know, don't expect it the next day or the next week. Sometimes these take months to come back. Just because you don't hear something in a relatively short period of time doesn't mean that it's been rejected and you just didn't hear back. Um, publishers are going to give you feedback, whether it's and, – and, you know, I've had articles, um, I've had things that I've written um, not accepted as well, 
that they'll say, you know, but it takes a while to get, get back. Um, uh, my study right now, I have not submitted the manuscript. I'm still working on it, Christy. Um, and that's going on, it'll probably be going on a year now. I'm, I'm working, finishing up. I finally finished up going over the data and, and then, um, and now I'm going to um, work on writing up the different sections and putting it together. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say about um, submitting is you you've submitted um, you you you're playing the weight game. Um, like I said, be patient. Don't be afraid of rejection. And and think about as you're as you're looking at that. Always keep in mind the next. Um, the next journal that you would want to put, you know, submit to, because you know, if you don't get feedback, good feedback, or you you get rejected, look at the next the next journal. Have it in mind so that you can turn it around um, and and resubmit. But again, these things take time. And I'll leave you with a key resource that I've picked up actually this semester again. And that's Cresswell, John W. Cresswell. Um, it's now in its fourth edition. It was just released, the fourth edition, and it's called Research Design, Qualitative, Quantitative, and Mixed Method Approaches. And what this book does is it's really a handbook on how to set up a qualitative study, a quantitative study, and a mixed method study. And so once you determine which route to go, and you can actually use this as a resource to determine that which one would yield the richest data. Then, you know, now you know. Okay, this is how the qualitatives are set up, and the quantitatives are set up, and the mixed methods are set up, especially with regards to your research questions, because the research questions for different studies are or different methodologies are written differently. And although I gave you a list of pretty much a rundown of what sections that journals look for, again, depending on the type of methodology, the type of study that you're doing, may determine, you know, it may not be as clear cut as having one section on your, you know, one section that talks about introduction, one section that talks about specifically the purpose statements and things of that nature, uh, because different studies yield different types of, of um, uh, again, different types of setups. Um, and so that's what I'll leave you with. Um, if you have any questions, please, by all means, ask me. Uh, but again, this hopefully you, you've gotten something out of this, and you'll now feel more comfortable about going towards publishing and also going towards your dissertation. Because again, a dissertation, as was, was told to me not too long ago, is just a really, really, really big exercise in writing. Uh, carrying out crafting, carrying out writing up a research study, which basically you can take those, take your your dissertation, and make them into different publications. So you're kind of doing two birds with one stone, killing two birds with one stone with your dissertation. But I would definitely um, suggest that you get a publication under your belt before you do your research study. Maybe even make it the pilot study for your research study, uh, your dissertation study, because they do like to see pilot studies done before that kind of give a springboard to that dissertation study. So good luck to you all, and hopefully you have gathered some information from this. Good, good. Thank you very much, Ryan. We really appreciate that. We do have a couple questions from the audience. Kathleen, would you like to just say your question? You have a really interesting one, and it really does piggyback on what uh, Ryan was just talking about. Would you just like to speak into the mic? Are you having a little trouble with your mic, Kathleen? It looks like she's having a little trouble. Okay, so Kathleen actually writes, um, Ryan, 
is it ever appropriate to try and publish an article from your teaching experiences that is grounded in current research that is not your own, and then how your own practice in the lit review is propelling you into conducting a future study? I'm not quite sure I understand that completely, um, Kathleen. Perhaps you can say it another way. I'm asking a specific question with a particular paper I've written for another degree that is going to inform some of my dissertation work. Oh, so can you actually, hmm, that's interesting. Um, Christy actually probably has experience in this because Christy, we're working on a paper that you are publishing that's similar to your research for your dissertation, right? Maybe you could speak to that just a little bit, unless Ryan, you've got some insights into that. I'm not 100% sure. I'm with you, Dr. Rose. I'm not 100% sure I completely understand the question. Yeah, I, I think, Christy, I think this question probably could be for you. Christy is writing a paper for Global Conversations and Literacy Research right now in which she is looking at um, communities of practice and affinity groups and saying that the online participation in web seminar longitudinal projects like Global Conversations doesn't really fit either of these two groups and so she's really looking at what are the intersections of these two groups that make GCLR a, a unique community. And do um, you want to say anything about that, Christy? Is everybody having trouble with their mic tonight? Uh, Christy, are you having trouble with your mic? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, you're not coming through, Christy. Well, uh, and anyway, um, hey. Christy's actually, oh, there you go. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Can you talk a little okay. bit about that? Um, I'll try to. I'm not sure I 100% understand Kathleen's question, but I, I'm going to give it a go. Um, I'm going to answer this in two ways. First of all, um, I had written a practitioner piece a couple of years ago that was based on research that had already been done, but it was my application of that research in the classroom. So that's one of my answers that I had done, that I have for you. The other is that, yes, um, currently the, the work I'm doing now with um, other colleagues is sort of a precursor for my dissertation. And so I think it's very wise to be able to do that. Um, it goes back to what Ryan was saying in terms of a pilot study. Even though it's not a pilot study, it is um, getting the information out there. Plus, you can then, if your article is published, you can then cite yourself in your dissertation or um, you and your colleagues in your dissertation, which is always a great thing to be able to do. So I think that, yes, it's okay to publish a piece based upon what you're doing in your classroom and then take that piece but make, find where the gap is and carry that into your own dissertation. I'm not sure I answered your question, um, but hopefully that, that's some information you can use. Yeah, actually, I think that is, I think now I understand it. Yeah, if, you, if, if yeah. you're doing writing workshop, for example, let's say you're doing Nancy Atwell's writing workshop and you've adapted it into your own teaching practice, can you write about that? Yes, of course you can. Yeah, that's exactly what a lot of people do is they take other people's ideas and then they work them into their own practice or into their own research, but then that practice or research is still unique because it's in your setting. So, yes, that's right. Good. Right, and one other thing I would add is is when you, I think Dr. Albers answered it also in the chat box, is you want to make sure that it, it's grounded in your own research. Don't just take something that somebody else did and rewrite it. The other thing is, is you want to be careful when you're doing a publication, you can actually, and I think I said this, you can take one study and you can actually try to attempt to have it published or seek to have it published 
in multiple different journals. But what you have to do is you have to be careful you're not doing the same one in the different journal. You want to put a different spin on it. You want to use the, the, the data differently to show in different pieces. Like you might put a quant – for my study, I could do it one piece and do quantitative and qualitative together, almost a mixed method. Or I could do it in one journal article as a um, qualitative and look at just the qualitative data. In another article, just the quantitative data. But I never want to take the same article and put it in one journal and then turn around and put it in another. I want to make sure that what I do put out there, if it's based on the same data or the same experience, that it shows different things or that it shows it in different ways, if that makes sense. Ryan, I tell you, that is just amazing advice. And the reason I say that is because I belong to the College of Education Promotion and Tenure Committee, and we talked about just that today, that a junior scholar going up for promotion or tenure, if they use the same data set and they write about it, the same data, in two different ways or three different journals, then it's not going to count as three separate publications in the eyes of the Promotion and Tenure Committee. It will look as if it's just one, you're just trying to mine, uh, M-I-N-E, this data to the point where people are going to say, oh, you've already written about that, or uh, Boylan, yeah, I've read that before. They won't even bother to read your other pieces because they've already read it twice before. So that's really good advice. If you have multiple slices of the data, um, then, and it's different, uh, the project might be the same, but the data is different, then yes, you certainly can write several pieces. And I think that's what Ryan is saying. The longitudinal data, I think, India, um, is interesting too because I asked that of the dean today. I said, well, what about longitudinal data? It still has to be different slices of data from uh, some work that you're doing. So if you continue to sort of work with the same data without looking at it in unique ways, then I think you're going to have difficulty. Would you say that, Ryan? Uh oh, I think, Ryan, you might have to hit your talk button. Yeah, I would. I would definitely say yeah. that. And that's really, it's really important information to know. I want to also emphasize, I'm an editor. There we go. Am I back yeah, on? You're, yeah, you're on. I want to just re-emphasize what Ryan said a little bit earlier. Yeah, I would definitely yeah, say that. About the format of, oh, Compton Lily, yes, that's good. That's a good a point, actually, India. She's actually done different slices of data at different years. So the project may be longitudinal, but she's still looking at different data from different uh, years. So that makes her study unique. If that's a way that somebody's looking at research and the data in that particular study, then certainly it would work. It's a little bit like uh, Shirley Bryce Heath, too. She's written multiple things on that 10-year study. So there's lots of different things that you can write about. But I want to just mention, I want to emphasize something that Ryan said earlier. I'm the editor of a language arts journal, and Ryan's format for writing articles is really a good one. You know, when we read articles, and we read a lot of them and determine which ones will get into the Language Arts Journal, we look for particular types of formats. We look for people who um, have got a literature review so that they actually understand the background, that they are theoretically grounded. You have to have some sort of theory. And then you have to have some sort of research or practice that will offer that audience something to take away, to sort of think about, to try in their own classroom. So Ryan's, um, Ryan's template for writing is a good one. Now, uh, I think uh, the other thing that Kathleen wrote is write the same way we do when we present at conferences. That's another little tip. Every time you present at a conference, you should write a paper to go with it, and then you can guarantee yourself lots of different publications. 
what happens is scholars go ahead and present at conferences, but they rarely turn those into papers. That's the best way to get published, is to take your conference proposal, before you present it, write it up as a paper, present it, get some feedback, if need be, revise it slightly, but then ship it off to a journal. And if you do two or three presentations a year, boom, you've got three different uh, pieces that you can, you can um, have published. Christy asked how long, how long you worked on your manuscript before you got published, Ryan. Um, boy. Um, it, the first one that I got published, again, or the first two, were not, it wasn't very long that I worked on them simply because uh, they were smaller uh, journals. And and so and they, I was pointed to those journals to kind of get a start and get my foot in the door. Um, so I didn't work on those as long as I'm working on the one that I'm working on now. This is my first really big study, if you'll call it that. And uh, I'm going on a year. It'll be a year in May. Um, actually, no, it's it's over a year now because I started the study um, last spring and I ran it last spring. And so it's I've slowly but surely been going through the data and doing some lit, lit review research and things of that nature. So it, it's well over a year for me now, but generally speaking, I think what, as, and again, this is beginning. This is kind of the beginning. It may take you longer because you haven't found your groove. You haven't found your, your balance of doing the research and writing up and, and things of that nature. Uh, but once you get used to it, you'll be turning them out left and right. And like I said, um, if you're really, really, really good at what you do, you could possibly be, as you're finishing one study up, you're already working on the next step. Okay, good. Um, Rebecca asks, so when crafting a study, is it advantageous to think about creating more than one data set in order to have more opportunities for multiple publications? That's a really good question. It's a good question, and I, I don't think the answer is very clear on that one. Again, it has to do with the methodology you choose that will give you the richest data. If you can get rich data through multiple different data sets, then that's fine. Then it will work. But if the richest data you're going to get is going to come from one data set, and maybe additional data sets will muddy the waters or will make it a little less clear, then maybe not so much. So it, again, it depends on the methodology and what you want to do with your research. Okay. We have time for maybe one more question. Is there anybody who'd like to ask a question of Ryan? So, um, Rebecca asks, it, you could aim for four, Rebecca, um, however, you, it just depends on where you want to write, how you want to write. I could imagine that you're in a setting for three months and you definitely could publish several pieces on that. There's no doubt about it. Um, yeah, you could, definitely, uh, you could definitely publish on several. Okay. What I'd like to say is thank you to Ryan Boylan. Let's all write something in the chat area about some comment that you learned uh, or that you'd like to say to Ryan about his presentation. We always like to get a little bit of feedback from this. I really want to thank Ryan. He has always been a champion when it comes to doing doctoral web seminars. He's always well prepared. And his insights into various aspects of the doctoral program are very, very keen. He offered some wonderful tips and advice on how to get published because he himself is a published author. So I really appreciate that. Ryan, thank you very much. We really appreciate your speaking with us tonight. I also would like to have you, if, it, if you haven't, I'd love to have you like us on Facebook. If you, have, if you go to Global Conversations and Doctoral Preparation in the Facebook area, you'll be able to like us and share this information with your colleagues. Especially, I want to uh, invite Jen and Jihei and Autumn to go ahead and spread
spread the word to the Korean students to see if perhaps they would be interested in presenting or joining us, and we'll try to find a time that fits for all of us to participate. So please share that information. I also want to uh, alert you to the other upcoming seminars for this spring. We've got Ms. Lindy Johnson from uh, University of Georgia who will talk about uh, Two Birds, One Stone, Strategies for Developing Your Academic Writing. We've got, and she will be presenting on March, March 13th, we've got Ms. Anne Marie Jackson and Ms. Uh, Sandy Matthews who will be presenting on April 3rd, and they're going to be talking about their PhD journey. Ms. Uh, Danielle Hilofsky is going to be talking about working smarter, not harder, and she is scheduled for, I think, April 15th. I forgot to put that date in there. So I really hope that you will put these on your calendar, and thanks, Jihei, for spreading the word. I really hope you will. And everybody else, if you can spread the word, that would be great, and invite people to present with you. Perhaps uh, you've got colleagues at another university or you've got colleagues from different parts of the world who might want to present with you, that would be even, I think, even more spectacular. So really think about that. And then I also, of course, want to put a plug in for our Global Conversations and Literacy Research Seminar Series. We have another one coming up, Dr. Ryoko Kubota, who's going to be presenting this Sunday on February 23rd. Catherine Beavis on March 16th in video and gaming and literacy, and of course, uh, Dr. Brian Street, whom everybody knows in their language and literacy programs, who will be speaking to us on April 27th. So please put those into your calendars. And thank you all for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Looking forward to seeing all of you at the university and in class and or online. So good night and thank you very much. <laughs>